and welcome. My name is Julianne Cost, and on today's episode of The Complete Picture, I'm going to talk about my five favorite new features in Photoshop. Now, the first new feature has to do with the Crop Tool. Now, to access the Crop Tool, I will tap the C key. And as many of you probably know, we made a lot of changes in the prior version to the Crop Tool. One of the enhancements that we made was the ability to change the aspect ratio that you were cropping while still in the crop tool. So you didn't have to back out of the crop tool just because you decided to change your mind on the aspect ratio. But we also heard and received a lot of feedback that by changing the default to aspect ratio, it made it much more difficult for some customers to go in and actually enter in a width, height, and resolution. So you'll notice now up at the top, right below ratio, we have the option where you can enter the width, height, and resolution. And in fact, we've also reintroduced the two arrows here that will swap the height and width so you can quickly um, transform those width and heights. Or, of course, you can use the X key. In addition, there's a feature called front image, which basically takes the dimensions of the front image and puts them in the width, height, and resolution, making it very easy to crop two documents to the same size. So we've also kind of brought that or elevated that up a little bit, and you can just select that now from this list. So these enhancements are obviously a direct result of all of the feedback that we got and are one of the benefits that we can offer to our subscribers because we can move much more quickly. All right, the next feature that I want to talk about has to do with Liquify. And again, in the previous version, we made a lot of enhancements to Liquify, including uh, enabling you to use a larger paintbrush in Liquify, and we made it a lot faster by taking it off of the CPU and elevating it to the GPU. But one of the things that was still missing was the ability to re-edit those changes that you made in Liquify. So in the new version, you'll notice on the Layers panel, if I right mouse click and convert this layer to a smart object, and then choose Filter and Liquify, I can now liquify a smart object. So let's go ahead and just make a change here. Now, I want to freeze this bottom area of the rock so I don't change it. But I do want to just pull in this edge a little bit, and maybe a little bit more up here. That's a little bit too much, maybe right to there. So I'm just making some changes here to the shape of the rock. But when I click OK, you'll notice that because I've converted this layer into a smart object, Liquify now behaves as a smart filter. So it's very flexible. If I want to toggle off, the changes that I've made, I simply click on the eye icon, click it again in order to toggle them on, and if I want to make changes, I simply double click where it says liquify. That brings me back into the liquify dialog box, and if I choose to show my mesh, you can see that it's actually held on to the changes that I made the last time I was in here. So liquify has become a non-destructive change that you can make in Photoshop. All right, my third favorite new feature has got to do with those lens blur filters. Very similar to Liquify, if I now right mouse click on this layer and convert it to a smart object, I can now go under the filter menu and sure enough, field blur, iris blur, and tilt shift are all available. So if I want to add a tilt shift blur here, I can do so. Let's just rotate it a bit, scoot the pin over to the trees, and just increase that blur amount. Now, when I tap Enter or Return in order to apply that, you can see here on the Layers panel that because I was working with a smart object, that blur becomes a smart filter. If I want to make changes to it, I double click where it says Blur Gallery, and then we can update this non-destructively. The other advantage is that you see that whenever I add a smart filter, I get a smart filter mask. So if there's a portion of my image where I don't want this blur to make a change, I can tap the B key to get my paintbrush, click on the smart filter mask icon, get a little bit larger of a brush, and make sure that I'm painting with black in the mask. And let's just zoom in so that I can show you that wherever I paint with black, it's going to remove that filter. So it's just another way to make a non-destructive edit and give us a lot more control with the new blur filters. 
And of course, this also works with video. So let's do a file open in Photoshop, and I'm going to open this image sequence right here. Now, by default, when you open an image sequence, you get a video clip, but I can always convert that video clip into a smart object. Now that it's a smart object, we can go to Filter, I can go down to Blur, and then we can add our Tilt Shift to this video sequence. And again, this is all non-destructive because this is a smart object. I'll tap Enter or Return, and now I have my Tilt Shift Blur as a smart filter. And I forgot to mention it, but with Liquify, you can also use Liquify on a video layer. And my next favorite feature has to do with type styles. In the previous version, we enabled both paragraph styles and character styles. But every time you opened a new document, you would have to load in those styles. There was no default set of styles. Now, you'll notice that if you've got maybe your, your set of styles that you use most often, you can simply use the flyout menu and then load these as your default type styles. And what that means is that from now on, whenever you open a document in Photoshop, a new document, these default type styles will be loaded and easily accessible. Now, if you open up a document that already has type styles in it, meaning like a legacy file or an existing file, then we're not going to automatically load the default type styles because we assume that you have the styles that you want in that set. If you want to add the default type styles to the styles that are in that document, you can always choose to load the paragraph styles. And we won't replace the ones that are in the document, we'll just append your default to that. In addition, if you open up an existing document that doesn't have any type styles in it, then we will automatically load your default type styles into that document. So that should make working with type a lot easier. And finally, my last favorite feature has to do with the Actions panel. So let me close all of my open documents here. And we're going to take a look at the new ability to add conditional actions. So what this means is if you have a large number of images, and say some of them are in RGB, or some of them are in CMYK or grayscale, or maybe some of them have layered documents, or maybe they're horizontal or vertical images, it's going to be much easier to run an action that says, if the document is this type, then do this. Otherwise, do something else. So let me show you a quick example here. We'll look at my Actions panel. You can see here that I've got two different actions that I've created because I want to add two different edges depending on if the image is horizontal or vertical. So for one set of images, I want to add a dark edge, and on another set of images, I want to add a light edge. So I've created those two actions. But let's say I've got you know 500 images that I want to run this on. Well, I don't want to have to choose all of my vertical images and run the first action, and then select all of my horizontal images and run the action. So what I've done is I've created a conditional action. And let me just show you how to do that. I'll just click the New Action, and we'll just call this Test for now. I'll click Record, and then you'll notice that from the flyout menu, we have a new option to Insert Conditional. So now we can see that if the current document has one of these attributes, then we can tell Photoshop to play a specific action. So for example, if my current document is landscape, I want Photoshop to play the Add Landscape Edge. But if it's not landscape, then I'm going to assume that it's vertical, and I'll want it to play the vertical edge. When I click OK, you can see the if then or the conditional action has been added. All right, now we can just throw that away because that's the exact action that I have right here. So how would I run this? Well, I would go to File, Automate, and then choose Batch. And we could choose a folder full of images. So let's go ahead and select that. Here I have a few images. Some of them are horizontal, some of them are vertical. They've been exported at the correct size from Lightroom, so 4 by 6 at 300 pixels per inch. That happens to be the size of the edges that I'm using. So I'll select Choose. Then I want to select a destination because 
As we can see, each one of these action has the option to save, but when I was recording the action, I just saved things to the desktop. Those save commands contain really two things, the file format that you want to save in and the location. I still want to include the, the portion that saves as the file format because I want them to save as a JPEG, but I want to actually override the portion that says where to save those files. So I'm going to choose a new location. I'm going to go to the desktop. We're going to create a new folder, and I'm going to call this with edges. We'll click Create and then select Choose. So now I'm telling Photoshop to override the action Save As commands, like don't save it on the desktop, save it instead in this folder, but still save as a JPEG file. Excellent, now when I click OK, you can see Photoshop is going to open up each one of those images, and it's going to play the correct action. So if I just open them up here in Bridge and move through them, we can see in the preview area that depending on whether the image was horizontal or vertical, it has either a dark or a light edge. So I think that's going to save photographers a lot of time when they're batch processing. And of course, there are additional new features specifically targeted towards our design segment. For example, you can now load swatches from an HTML document, a CSS document, or an SVG document. You can also copy CSS from a single layer or a layer group in Photoshop, copying attributes like text attributes, like character or paragraph attributes, or shape attributes. And so that should make the handoff from the designer to the developer much more efficient. In addition, we've made enhancements to 3D, and of course we have the Retina display support for the Mac. So lots of new features. I hope you'll check them out. My name's Julianne Cost. Thanks for watching.